Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for this illustration program. We have with us uh, Darren Xiao, a visual storyteller, and Li Sing Li, an independent illustrator. I will let them introduce themselves and share more of their murals later. This program is held in conjunction with the National Library's exhibition, Human Nature, Environmental History of Singapore. This exhibition traces the history of Singapore's natural environment and how our present day relationship with it is shaped by this legacy. The exhibition is now on until 26 September 2021 and you will be able to scan the QR code on screen now to visit our website and also get the latest updates. I will actually hand over the session to Daryl and Singli. Take over please. Thanks, Pelek. Okay, let me just... Switch over. Okay, all can see my... can see a slide, right? Yep, we can see our moral. Great. Okay. So a really good morning to everyone here who's joining us today. So, uh, you know, initially this workshop is going to be something that just in person. And I'm so glad that, you know, even though things have changed, uh, have switched around a little bit, we're still able to meet all of you. And in fact, you know, many, many more than we had originally planned for. So, you know, it's, it's such a great honor to be able to share and tell you a little bit more about our mural and, and natural history uh, on a Saturday morning. So I would just kind of like to introduce the mural a a little bit about the mural before we get in proper to the workshop. So this is entitled An Unnatural History. And what it does is it captures the many layers of history uh, in the Queen Street area, around the Brass Vasa area. And something that's quite unique, especially for today, is that, you know, it's, it's the area where we find a, the National Library building. Uh, Singli and I were based in the National Design Centre, which is just across the road. And if you take the back exit and kind of just walk along down Queen Street, that's where the mural is. So this is an area that, you know, means a lot to us, uh, where there's the kind of places that we always spend our time uh, eating, you know, searching out the best food, or kind of just uh, being steeped in history, or just searching out the different stories that kind of envelope a place. So what we've done with this mural is you really kind of examine the you know, what we can see there, the different levels of uh, stories that have been built up over the years, and especially something that's quite important. And this combines uh, Singli's interest of uh, architecture, heritage, with my own when it comes to nature, and this interaction between a uh, human and nature, which once again ties back into uh, the library's exhibition. So, you know, it's a perfect kind of synergy, combining all the different things that we're so passionate about, that we love talking about, and we love kind of just going through and uh, what's going to happen today is that uh, Singh will be sharing a little bit more about the process of the mural, how we created it, the different stages before, you know, I'll take uh, all of us through uh, some time to create your own version of the mural. So capturing your stories of your neighborhood, maybe a place you grew up, or just an area that means a lot to you and how you can combine all this into an illustration. So I'm going to introduce both of us. And this is a picture taken a few years ago at Singh Lee's um, and another of Singli's mural in our time held in Sam. And, <laughs> and as you can see, uh, we, we are very serious when we, we want to capture the, an accurate version of uh, our, our interactions with, with the different spaces. So, you know, as, as I shared earlier, both of us, we shared a studio in the National Design Centre. So something that was quite unique is we thought, okay, when this mural project came about, we're going to have time to be able to kind of send uh, files, you know, just instead of having to send files, to just walk over to the side of the table, uh, you know, look at files, discuss it, kind of plan it, you know, as, as though it's a perfect kind of collaborative environment. But as we all know, things took a slightly different twist. And as a result, we actually did the project remotely, you know, working at, at, in different places, having to send huge, huge files just because of how large the mural is, which as, um, if I'm not wrong, it stands at 40 meters wide. So we'd split out the file to many different sections and send it over. So I'm going to introduce myself. I'll just share a little bit about myself before I pass the time on to our very uh, befittingly dressed uh, singly. So I'm, I'm Daryl and I'm an illustrator and, you know, just 
very much like Singly, you know, we love telling stories about images. So in particular, something that really excites me is that I love working with uh, children. So when it comes to creating children's picture books, finding ways to make uh, things that, you know, some people might find a little bit boring. So sometimes whether it's history, science, or things that I, I personally really love, but others might find a little bit uh, less than interesting and how we can uh, infuse it with storytelling and make it a bit more interesting and exciting. And something I also love doing is working with lots of different kinds of uh, uh, references from nature. So whether it's using animals to create characters or being inspired by different kinds of plants, a lot of the work I do is it's very much in line with uh, the natural world. And personally, I also, something that I, I do quite a bit recently is run different kinds of workshops for mostly for kids. So something that's quite unique about this session today is that it's for grown-ups. And, you know, together with Singly, you know, we've worked on a, a workshop before uh, preparing something for kids. So this is also the first time we're running a workshop for adults. So it's, we're so glad to have all of you here with us today. Okay, so I'll pass the time on to Singly right now. Hello, good morning. Uh, so Daryl has introduced myself. So now it's fine. I'm Singly, the other partner for this project. So if you have known me, I, I do mostly of my works are on uh, heritage related things of uh, Singapore, the landscapes, food, uh, architecture. And uh, recently I've done a series on uh, Singapore streets, which uh, began during um, the cycle, because I started cycling during the circuit breaker. And um, so, yeah, so both of us have very different interests. So Daryl is into plants and nature and he has a, huge passion for uh, fishes as well. And during the same conversations, he was also covering on birds. So for me, it's mostly buildings and history. And uh, this project allows us to bring both of our interests into a piece to present this narrative at uh, Queen Street. All right. Um, so it started off like uh, we have a sketch. So we're given this very cute site that um, Queen Street, uh, the former Singapore Art Museum at AQ, uh, which is undergoing some renovations. But they have this huge hoarding uh, in front of the building. And we are to present uh, our artworks uh, on this hoarding. And we are interested in presenting on uh, the layers of narrative that is uh, present in the site. And the inspiration came from because our overseas trips and we and visits to museums such as the uh, the various natural history museums in the in the world, or like the British Museum in London. So every time we when we look at how to present the different cultures uh, and uh, nature, we have the taxidermic cultures and uh, or even things that we feel that sometimes can be a bit quite ching ching chong chong when they present our uh, Asian cultures. And uh, we were wondering, uh, uh, looking at how this uh, uh, present representations of culture and nature is being done in the museum. Can we do something similar for our artwork at uh, AQ? Uh, what if we present this narrative and because it's presented, uh, what is drawn there, will people accept it, what it is at the site? And uh, some of here are some of our visual references that Daryl and I has put together on Pinterest. Um, I, so Pinterest is also this um, platform where you can find various kind of uh, uh, different kind of visuals for aesthetic uh, references and makes you feel a bit insecure as an illustrator as well, looking at all the great works there. So when we look at murals from like the, by Belgian illustrators in uh, Brussels or uh, like uh, designs of uh, uh, exhibitions in Japan and Taiwan and, uh, as, and murals from other countries. So we we're thinking whether we can do something similar, we present a scene at the AQ mural itself. So after looking through the visual references, here is one of the first um, drafts that we did. Uh, so Daryl that added his uh, touch by uh, mixing um, uh, natural landscapes of forests and uh, oceans in the piece. Uh, thinking that because you he also reasoning that uh, in the past um, before Singapore is built up, uh, it was also uh, pristine green land in certain areas, and uh, for myself, it I'm interested in uh, presenting buildings that are uh, already gone around Queen Street, uh, the vicinity of Queen Street. 
And if I can jump in very quickly at this point. So if you look at the right side, right, uh, you know, that's, that's the area that we always thought looks resemble something like a fish tank. So whenever there are different displays, changing displays, you kind of look on in and you know what, what a perfect kind of a, uh, area for us to kind of just play around. So that kind of took on the, the idea of the ocean. We imagine that, you know, it's a whole vista, a whole landscape. And then as you move to the right side, you, you see a little bit of a, a fish tank there. And I uh, just want to also share that, you know, if any of you have questions along the way, uh, you want to find out a bit more, you know, what is the process, you know, how we created it, you can ask it in the Q&A section and we'll respond to it uh, as, as we see it pop up. So, you know, instead of waiting to the end, in which you may have forgotten, you know, what we spoke about, you can just kind of uh, just yeah, ask a question straight away and we'll just answer it. Okay, thanks, Ingrid. Okay, yeah, so we did quite a few different sketches of the, uh, what we, we feel like drawing for the site. And, uh, and some of them can be very, very simple. Like here is a really a schematic one. So uh, even before the fish tank one, sometimes I thought, what if we can put a, the ocean concept at the center of the piece and it's framed by a tree. So it's like we blend, we try to soften the edges of the, the actual site and the drawing itself by uh, also responding to the, elements that can be found around the uh, site itself, like uh, the benches, the trees, and even the columns of the AQ building. And uh, so here are some of the elements that we try to isolate for uh, things that is related to the current site as well. So you, on the right side, you can see the columns of uh, the AQ building. And then uh, there's also the gateposts of the, uh, of the building. And the building was formerly the Catholic high school. So we felt that these are interesting elements to include. So here are more of those sketches. So here we, we decide, okay, the, the column area shall be the fish tank. And uh, you can see the background is framed by certain buildings. So eventually it developed into this, uh, which is closer to the current uh, iteration already. So some of the buildings you can see that's being featured is uh, buildings from the vicinity, including the Central Sheikh Temple, the former Central Sheikh Temple at Queen Street, or um, the Victoria Building at uh, Victoria Street. And here are just a progression of the sketches before we actually work on the actual thing. And uh, so I started off with my, my part first. I added in the building suspect. Then uh, the blank spaces will be added in by Daryl. And then see me with you that I'm not very good at, at following the instructions also. It's like, uh, you know, whenever he, he say, okay, this is the part I'm supposed to jump in or so do. I'm like, hey, can, can you move things a little bit and can I shift things around a little? So uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's always a, a very kind of uh, continuous process as well, especially mm. since, you know, for example, we were, plan when we were planning it out, right? Like the measurements that we're taking, we we're kind of planning, okay, the tree should be here because it coincides mm. with the break. Then it turns out that some of the measurements, as you can see in the image, was wrong when Sydney cycled down and actually meticulously kind of measured everything. So, you know, like th these were some of the very kind of basic standard kind mm. of logistic issues that imagine if we printed it out and it just didn't really sync up, which was quite crucial because, you know, we wanted it to align whether it's the pillars at the side or, you know, certain other kind of structural elements. Yeah, yeah. so like what Daryl mentioned, so sometimes even though, even if you're if they provide you the blueprints, uh, it's better to double check. I think this one, if any of, any of you are in the architecture scene or design scene, I think you might have experienced this before, like a column appearing out of nowhere. And um, so for here, is, uh, you can see the red markings are the changes to the, the, the measurements. So the reason why is also because the mirror work is so big and we did it digitally. So um, in order to make it um, pragmatic that we can work on some of our not so high end computers we have to break into segments to work on and uh, it's also very challenging during the so we used to work together in the studio but once during the circuit breaker and afterwards uh, when we move out uh, the communication become more um, uh, challenging so sometimes you see that uh, so for the left side segment d was it's supposed to be 6000 we changed it to 5700 mm so we have to adjust all this accordingly uh, so here you can see both of our stuff is coming up together and uh, one of the inspiration for like, the working method was um, AI Spot. So we were looking at AI Spot, how they work, uh, Jackie and Ned Gui. And so we were sort of like looking at ways that um, two illustrators could work together. Uh, yeah, it's, it's quite challenging when you are not in the same physical space. And uh, here's the coloring. Was... So, oh, Daryl, you I can... just want to add like, one more thing is that uh, 
So, you know, we, we had shared the space for about a year already, but haven't really actually worked on the same piece together. So lots of conversations, lots of discussions. But I think it's never quite the same as when, you know, you kind of put a piece there, when you draw something, you can immediately kind of respond and shift. But, you know, it, it kind of required a lot of work to kind of ex explore something before you can move on. So when it came to this, you know, there's a lot of, um, in a sense, uh, extra rounds of work, which, which kind of stretched out the whole process. And it was a great learning opportunity, you know, finding out how each of us would work. Uh, and again, Signe will tell you that, you know, I probably spent a bit too much time kind of like uh, being before being ready to commit. Well, he, you know, prefers to kind of dive deep and kind of like test things out and then see how it goes. So, mm -hmm. you know, throughout this process is also very much like um, the, I, I suppose if I were to link it quite tenuously to, you know, what the, the space is, you know, many different levels of many different layers created in different styles, different ways, and before they all kind of fit in together. Um, so yeah, Daryl mentioned that it's quite a, yeah, so sometimes during the whole process, there are certain um, sparks as well, because, because when, when there's a certain <laughs> shift to some of the key elements, it actually means that I have to rectify it uh, and, and try to prepare the, the files for him as well. Uh, but yeah, so he's, he's the one is, uh, he tend to do a lot of the thinking and the idea side while I'm the person who is like the project management. So most of the time I have to be the bad guy to keep things moving, <laughs> to meet the tight deadlines. And uh, so here you can see where it is like Daryl's, Daryl's work has uh, slowly come in. So uh, that's where we also realized that uh, there we have a different kind of approach to work. So um, so Daryl needs a certain framework while I'm the kind of uh, uh, more keen to try out things first before, before, uh, before actually uh, settling on something. So, and then it's coming together already in this part. Uh, then after that, uh, there's also those, uh, uh, so after the artwork meets the dimensions and all those are done on paper, you still have to uh, take an account where the implementation is could be a bit off. So we are, so even though the, the columns actually initially we weren't intended to align with the actual AQ columns, but when, when the printing was done and uh, put up, it was a bit off, but we also think that we, accept, we felt that that kind of accident is also okay with it because the artwork was all about this, about um, this idea of things, whether it is what it is. And um, so if we present the columns this way and, uh, and it's not aligned, so which one is like, what, which version do you accept? Um, so this is the mural currently up at AQ. So to answer that question is that, uh, so there are some buildings here that are already no longer around. So here are some examples of uh, some of those buildings that I've drawn. And um, so you can see there's the, uh, the former Tiger Balm Medical Hall at 100 Saligi Road and uh, the former Empress Hotel, which is at the, uh, current, the current site of the National Library. And uh, there are some buildings that are still around as well. So uh, Middle Road, the former St. Anthony Primary School now is the National Design Center. And uh, here are some of the resources that I refer to when I was doing the drawing. So I looked up the, the National Archives and I looked at the photos from um, Pictures SG, which tends to come from the collection of uh, Liquid Lean. And uh, there's also books by on the collection of Liquid Lean's photo that I refer to, like uh, Dr. Lai Chikian's um, uh, Through the Lens of Liquid Lean. And um, then there's also, because now over time, there's also a lot of people who share their more personal histories of uh, the site. Uh, you can refer to blogs. So you have Jerome Lim, you got, uh, I remember SG, and Roots SG that also do, does some documentation. So some of the references of Empress um, Hotel came from Roots SG. Uh, so the, the mirror is um, printed on the wall. Uh, it's a vinyl sticker print. So previously the artwork was by Herman Chong. So the next, after 6 June, uh, will be printed over again. And the original artwork, um, it's uh, one is the one, but at 150 DPI. So the reason why we chose that is so that the treatment of the artwork, um, we, we can add in more details also. And, and more also, I guess one, one, yeah, well, one mm -hmm. thing to add here is that so Singli's work is always marked by, you know, lots of details, lots of uh, kind of very vivid uh, imagery. And I think uh, when it comes to my work is also, um, as you shared, I, I prefer things a bit more idea-based and conceptual and uh, not so with, with perhaps fewer details. So I'm not quite used to kind of um, adding so many things inside and also kind of have so much going on. So I, it was a bit of a challenge also kind of uh, managing this 
end and figuring out, you know, how things would, uh, how things would kind of come together. So on the, I think a few of you have asked about, you know, how uh, the, the styles kind of came together and how they complemented each other. So, you know, something I'd like to add here is that both of us, I, I think we, you know, our, our approach to working is quite different. We're still uh, interested by the same kind of things. So whether it's uh, the different levels of history and so in terms of the overall narrative, we were quite certain, you know, it's something that's quite consistent that uh, we knew we wanted kind of um, to balance nature, uh, basically human in nature and also thinking about how, uh, but that, you know, the ex exact angle or how it will be kind of drawn out, that, that's really up to us to see how we want to kind of uh, explore it. And some of the feedback that we've, we've heard from friends, especially is that, you know, when they see it, they go, hey, it, it looks like one single piece initially, but when you pay a bit more attention, when you kind of zoom into the details, you notice that, okay, this one's done by Singy, this one's done by myself. And by the same time, it still kind of works as a piece. And that was something that, uh, you know, we, we hope we were able to achieve and, and we hope it also feels this way. There's not, um, it's not a case where, you know, it's at, um, is in contention with each other, but that they really complement each other and they, they work together such that um, you, you find this combination, which very much reflects the space itself of the different layers, but of, let's say, different architectural styles of like uh, trees and buildings and how they all come together. And just kind of uh, reply to Nick, I think someone was asking also about how long the mural took. So we started... Uh, early last year so just before everything kind of came about you know we started thinking okay maybe we have to start making taking some special precautions but uh we, we actually just started that some of the sketches came about before you know we, we didn't we had to kind of work from home and everything and then most of the process actually took the rest of uh the year so from about let's say april all the way until the end of the year sting do you want to share about the working file uh yeah the working file so it's it's not surprising to see working files about two at least one to two gigs uh so so the technical side is that um we use a mix of like google drive one drive uh for the file sharing and um you have to take extra care to make sure the files are updated so we try to name it by dates uh. so those are some of the more technical aspect of it and uh yeah just that already touches on the style but even though both of us uh, does uh, have slight differences in our style. Um, but because I think we concentrate in uh, very specific areas. Uh, so my, my side, I, I always look at uh, buildings and uh, I tend, to, tend to draw the people. And um, while Daryl draw the, the various kinds of birds and animals that you can find around the mural, uh, I think because that the two subject matter is separate, it also kind of complements each other. Right? So you won't see a uh, similar two different renderings of a building or at most you might see a little bit of my little Easter eggs like the otters and chickens popping by, but, but most of most of the animals are done by Daryl. So at least that will also reduce the conflicts of uh, having different styles. Like. And um, yeah, so Daryl will actually share more later about uh, the kind of what references uh, he look at also for the his depiction or his choice of depicting which animals feature in the piece. Uh, so this is more images of the mirror at night. Uh, yeah, so this is the fish tank that he was talking about. Then on the left side, you see the Mei Shi Yang Fu. Uh, so someone may eat Taylor. Someone someone actually saw it and uh, then I found out that they are, they are actually. There's a relative that was uh, they they were related to the tailor or owns that shop, and uh, yeah. So these are kind of the surprises we have. So for Daryl, he actually goes and do uh bird counting. He goes on hikes, uh, and yeah, he spent a lot more time in nature than me. I tend to spend more time at uh, having kayatos and kopi and looking around people and buildings. <laughs> so both of us have very different uh, interests. So some also of the buildings are. Uh, hmm. hmm. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. We finish first. So some of the buildings highlighted in the piece is the Empress Hotel and uh, the, some of the specific references that I got from uh, Roots SG. So this one is taken from the 1950s and uh, you have uh, like Mooncake Abbott from the Empress Restaurant and the Hotel. So this is where the, the current site is now the new, the new National Library. And uh, the Tiger Balm building that I mentioned about uh, even has a clock tower. So it has been demolished recently. I think yeah, it's uh, where people have the virtual being cut, the, the current site. So they have cleared the building. I think on my end, something that I also appreciated a lot was that, you know, I 
like you said, like uh, Sydney sharing, like the virtual binker. So we're also familiar with the space. You just keep walking by, and I I cannot remember how many times you know I just I'm familiar with the building at ground level. I look at the the arches, so you know how wide the the kind of pathway is. But I don't think I don't even look up. I don't even kind of like uh, study the the overall structure. And to know that some of these have uh, so many levels of history is just quite wonderful. So you know, just kind of working on this, I I learned so much about the space and even just uh, different levels of history. It's not that I couldn't find it before. It's not that it's it's really kind of difficult to find information. But I think uh, something that Singh does really well is that he sheds light and he's able to focus on some of these stories. That make it so much more accessible to to just everyone, and just wanted to uh, comment also. So, my dear was asking that uh, you know, do I spend uh like a lot of time in nature? So, I would say uh, I I would love to spend more time uh doing so. So, I've got friends who you know every weekend or every you know, multiple times a week they be out kind of whether it's bird watching, kind of searching for uh different animals all around Singapore, and I think that's something that I always wish that I can do a bit more of because most of the I would say. Something that I do a lot now is a lot of time behind the screen or kind of doing research. But I think it's uh, this combination of both sides. Uh, so that's something I wish to do more of. But at the same time, uh, let's say right now, if it's not, not quite the ideal situation to be out and about, then I think you know, uh, this substitute could also just work as well, whether it's taking references or just being uh, inspired by what I see. So it doesn't need to be, let's say, deep in the jungle, but it could also be, let's say, the miners or the pigeons that kind of just are flying outside the window. So like, like even though we have different, we have different um, interests, uh, sort of influence each other as well. Uh, you can see the plant at the back, in my background. So I think that is part of his influence. Because we're doing his studio, he has so many plants outside the studio, but it, it really gives the place uh, this nice feeling. Uh, rather than a, just a grey, grey, concrete, little rectangle box. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's some of this influence. So I tend to look out for some of the birds as well. And even when I cycling, I also try to listen to different kind of bird songs that you can hear uh, in Bongo or even in Changi. And for the dream project, I think both of us has very, probably a different takes on it, but we are quite certain that we hope the dream project will give us uh, comfortable budget and timeline and we can eat a lot of chilashis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, show yeah, you a, some, yeah. you want to show the video of the mural first? And, let, uh, let me just add on to that. Yeah, so I, I think something that we always enjoy and especially when we're sharing the studio, right, is going for lunch together. So, you know, a lot of ideas kind of come about from that conversation. So there's also once we're waiting for fish soup, right, we just started drawing and just getting ideas uh, coming about. So it's, it's something that uh, I think we're, we're both, of, of course, everyone loves eating, but uh, as, as Singli also has this other, you know, part of his history as a food blogger, and uh, I just like to eat a lot. But, you know, at the same time, it's, it's something that we, we really enjoy the, we really enjoy the things that uh, we, we share in common and how, you know, some of these elements could be included in the, the mural in terms of what we do and in terms of the process. So I, I don't think there's an explicit level where you can say, okay, you know, because we are like this, we work in a certain way, but also that um, the, the kind of situation that we're in, in terms of sharing the space, you not know, having like neighbors kind of pop by um, or, you know, you're just inviting friends over, engaging in different kinds of conversations that could be about nature, could be about architecture. And that, that really helped uh, in kind of furthering our ideas and allowing us to find, you know, commonalities that we could explore. Do you want to share the mu sorry, the video right now? Yeah, I share the video. Uh, okay. it's, so it's just a short little clip of the mural in the morning. Hello, good morning. This is our mural at Queen Street. It is about 5 a.m. in the morning. So here we have a mascot from the Imaginarium in 2018. The Victoria Building, the former Victoria Building. Both Daryl and I are into scuba diving. So this is part the part where we have fishes and all of Daryl's favorite sea creatures. Over there we have the forest area. I think you can you will know who that cyclist refer to. And you can spot the car from Coney Island. Uh, the Tiger Bum building used to be at Prince Street. This structure is 
formerly at the corner of Bencoolen Junction. This area is the Bugis Market and the former Central Street Temple at Queen Street. So the mural will be up till 6th of June. If you can visit the mural, please take the opportunity to do so. Okay, yeah. So the next uh, Daryl will share about his uh, part in the mural. So I think some of the questions you have are for him, like the motive of the flying pig. Yeah. So Daryl, uh, you want to take over? Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, so right now, I'll just answer a few of them quite quickly before I jump on. So uh, the mural is at basically outside Brass Pass at MRT along Queen Street. So where Sam at AQ is or AQ at Sam, and then uh. You, you will kind of, and also there's one, there's um, a 90 degrees to our mural, there's another mural by Finbar. So that explores kind of like a future city, kind of uh, how perhaps, you know, we're going to move everything underground in the future when uh, climate change affects things differently or, you know, different levels of uh, development. So, uh, you know, it's a two in one kind of thing. And sadly, what happens to the mural after that is that it will be replaced by the new artwork. So, you know, much like what we were exploring in the mural itself, the different levels of history where, you know, things get kind of pushed aside, uh, covered up on the, it will still exist there, but there'll be many more layers of artworks just kind of uh, being stuck on top of it. So, um, yeah, and I think we also kind of, um, in, in talks with different people to see whether there, there can be another home for the mural or whether you know it can exist in many different forms. But one thing we want to share, and we'll be sending the link later, is that you can actually access the mural online as well. So if you know you're not able to stop by uh, during the next few weeks, you can kind of zoom into all the di different details, the Easter eggs, kind of spotting all the different things here and there. Okay. Thanks. So I uh, just want to share a little bit about how, you know, let's say on, on the nature side, how I got inspired. So, you know, Singley's uh, fascination with architecture uh, started because he, you, you know, he trained as an architect already. And it's something that has been uh, a long-standing interest. As for myself, I would say that the, the story starts many, many years ago when I was just interested in animals in, in every form. So especially dinosaurs, I've got a uh, one over here and, and fish like Singley shared. And, you know, so I've always shared, um, you know, a childhood with animals, keeping pets of all sorts of different forms. So I think right now, you know, it, um, there, there are many kind of different uh, implications if you were to, let's say, uh, cage up a certain animal or, you know, keep them in, in certain uh, conditions in, in captivity. But I think back then, you know, it's just about the pure connection with, with nature, being able to step into space to you know, just reacting to the, the trees or just kind of having that, uh, that, that interaction with animals that, that really kind of uh, excites me. So this is a project that I, I worked on with uh, Asian Diva. So they're an eco-tourism uh, company. Um, and something that's quite special is that we wanted to capture the idea of, you know, animals, so the Ubin animals uh, as characters. And I think something that's quite uh, special about this is that the, these are animals that you might have seen before, that you might be aware of, or you kind of like look at the basketball, you know, really... Um, a really tiny version of it a long, long way away, but you don't quite know about it. And what I wanted to do with this project was really to explore uh, how, you know, we can think about narratives that are there that uh, can excite people, that can get them interested to find out a bit more. And that's something that I do a lot of my work and something that we explored in the mural. So how do we make kind of facts? How do we make uh, history more accessible and in ways that, um, you know, can invite someone to find out more. So much like many of the different buildings that I go, oh, I, I did not know about this. And even let's say the National Design Center that has uh, taken on so many different roles over the years. So, you know, like what uh, Singley mentioned just now, it's also the, the Coney Island cow. So instead of, um, on, on the nature side, instead of just kind of limiting my, my scope to the, the brass buster vicinity, because also, you know, there, there isn't that kind of a level of segregation like animals where, Sorry, unlike the, the human side of things where, let's say, this, this area was uh, set up by a certain type of people or, you know, it's uh, a space where um, you, you need to, certain kinds of shops are there. But, you know, a question that we've, or at least a, a theme that we've always explored, especially in, in conversations for nature, is that it's, it's all kind of uh, connected. It's all kind of, you know, the animal's not going to say, okay, because I'm... Uh, I, I live in this area and I'm going to spend the rest of my life there. So, you know, some of the... Um, uh, characters featured were those that um, exist in our 
in our shared memory, in our shared kind of uh, consciousness when it comes to nature. So you've got the Coney Island cow. You've also got the, you know, Inuka. So a, a very famous kind of tropical polar bear. We've got Arming over here with Bernard Harrison. So I wanted to include, you know, some things that uh, people would recognize immediately. They would identify and, you know, be able to connect with. But we've also got the Neptune cup sponge. So this was, you know, a sponge that was thought to be extinct for many years and it was before it was rediscovered. So in the kind of work that we do, it's, it's a combination of uh, research at the same time, uh, what we come across, what we find, what we already know, and how we can put it all together. And I suppose if there's anything, just there's, there's too much to take in and uh, just too many levels of, uh, this just too much to kind of explain and go into detail. So if there are, you know, details that you spot along the way, you want to find out more about. And I think someone was asking about the flying pig. So uh, I don't know whether to apologize for this, but I love lots of puns and lots of kind of a wordplay in, in the type of work that I do. So in this case, you know, I wanted to explore a, a world in which pigs are flying and see how, uh, you know, man and nature can coexist or whether it's going to be something that's a li little bit more uh, in conflict. And there are many hidden details that uh, Singh has also located. So whether it's his mascot, his chicken, or, you know, other details from um, popular culture as well. So, and, and then, you know, some of the other examples could be very transient visitors. So like the Himalayan griffin vulture. So, you know, they, they come from the Himalayas. So very, very far away. But at the same time, you know, they do uh, find themselves occasionally in Singapore during certain periods of the year. So I wanted to just focus on some of these uh, rarer visitors as well, because it, you know, even as, as rare as they might be, they also kind of do uh, play a role in our portrait of Singapore's history. And we do also come across certain other animals, which I think, you know, hornbills, which used to be so much rarer in the past, they become, they've become something that, you know, you would be quite happy to spot along the way. So we see the picture on the left where hornbills are happily kind of just resting uh, along HDB corridor. But on the other hand, you know, when we do see more of them, they come into certain levels of conflict. So in this case where hornbill has uh, very conveniently had a songbird for lunch. So, you know, it's something that, that will be explored quite a bit during the mural. And we were not making any kind of explicit conclusions at the same time. So we, we're inviting people to you know, question what, what it means to have to be to living to be living with nature in such close proximity. And the same thing happens with wild boar. So a uh, super bad example of what you shouldn't be doing is in the bottom left corner where you know you're, you're just way too close for comfort, or you know, certain other interactions where the wild boars end up uh, pillaging and ravaging through different um, different types of food that have been brought in, so whether it's an Ubin or even different parts of Singapore. So, you know, this is something I've always been interested in. And um, while working on this project, I spoke to two other, uh, two other friends of mine. So like Robert Zhao, another artist, and Dr. Yong Tingli, who is a, a conservationist. So we also had some programs that were uh, run in conjunction with uh, our mural, which would be on the website and hosted on the website itself. So you can check out some of these discussions. And uh, Singli spoke to Dr. Lai Chi Kien, and we'll be speaking to Dr. Yo Kang Shua after that. So we'll be sending more, we'll be sharing some details about all of this. But, you know, consistently throughout the, the conversations, always a case where, you know, it's essentially an, animals have been, a uh, wildlife and me have been uh, the original residents of the space and we are slowly encroaching upon the space. So how do we live alongside them when we see, let's say, hornbills in, in, in the city? Or, you know, even a case where we are crowding all the nature reserves right now. What are the implications of some, some of these actions and, you know, how do we kind of... Um, uh, navigate the space as we head into a more um, overpopulated Singapore. So certain other elements that were included, you know, uh, I, I wanted to factor in some elements of myth. So we, we think of saltfish uh, on the legend of Bukit Merah as a typical kind of saltfish, right? Maybe the kind that you have in sushi, but we actually know them as the todak. So these are needle fishes, and if you notice the bills actually much, much smaller. And if any of you have tried fishing before, you know, you have to catch them in a, in a different way because they don't really bite down. You actually have to kind of create a, a loop in which uh, you kind of snag them that way. And also, you know, certain other things like the legend of Sang Mila Utama and the lion. So, you know, many different things that we wanted to capture. So in my case, it was just more of if there's an animal that's related in Singapore, how, how is it going to fit in the, within the greater consciousness and how can we kind of fit it within the story of uh, the Braswasa vicinity? And there's also um, one, one uh, 
aquarium that I want to talk about. So the Vancouver Aquarium is something that I remember visiting many years ago. So I think just, we were just a few years old when it finally uh, shuttered. But uh, it's something that I, I love a lot because I even, I literally even dreamt about it. You know, dreamt about uh, restarting my own version of it and uh, kind of building the, building all the different tanks. I remember I even drew out a whole schematic of how it would look. But, you know, this was one of the, the very first like, public aquariums in Singapore. And it, I, I believe it's, it's all the more interesting because, you know, aquarium in, in an island city and we are able to kind of witness animals from all across the world, how the, the sea is literally connected and how we get a chance to see all this. So I've included some of the different animals that were found back then. And also, you know, um, I guess some people are a bit more familiar with interactions like uh, listening to birds can be hung up and in, for almost public display, public enjoyment. So these are all the different, some of the different elements that I decided to include. Okay, so before we get on to the mural, just want to check, do we want to take a few more questions first? Seeing anything that popped up in the meantime? Uh, they're asking why the animals are flying or moving one direction. Is it a reference to one uh, direction? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so when it comes when it when it comes to the the idea that I wanted to explore, you know, a case where you you could think of let's say many of the the human characters are almost facing inwards, so while well, the animals are kind of like making their way across. So I'm thinking that, uh, it's it's almost like a an epic battle, right? Where you see both sides kind of coming together. But I also did want to show that, you know, if after they meet, you don't see this clash, you don't see it being bloody, you don't see kind of lots of go around, but that they kind of um, intersperse and they slowly weave into each other. So we witness a case where, let's say, we see the scuba diver in the ocean element. We also see, you know, like lots of the, the jungle fowl uh, dancing around the, the flower market and just kind of making their way there. And then if you go all the way to the left, where we witness the... And I'll, I'll show, be showing some more pictures also. We witness, you know animals in captivity. So you see um, aquarium tanks, you see kind of like pets being kept there. And, and also, um, especially since, you know, in Singapore, I think up till at least a while back was one of the, the top exporters of ornamental fish. So it's, it's something that I, I grew up with keeping lots and lots of fish. I've got uh, random fish triggers all around the room. And, you know, I just wanted to kind of feature things that were important to Singapore that I think many people don't really think of. Um, you, you know that Singapore has fish, but you wouldn't really think about our kind of global position. Okay, uh, I see a question to... by Philip Wong. So, hello, Philip. <laughs> hope, uh, hope, hope the situation in Taiwan is okay. Uh, so, during, I think for his question, uh, how to make the artwork relatable for people of different age groups. Um, uh, previously, so the current mural we have, like, so Daryl covers a subject matter that I think is quite universal. Uh, experiences with uh, plants, uh, nature. It's something that uh, transcends, I think, uh, ages and uh, cultures. Uh, then for myself, I, my, my subject matter, I think, uh, while it's site specific, uh, touching on the buildings that, that on some of the buildings that are no longer around and the transformation of the landscape around Queen Street, I think the feeling of uh, nostalgia or uh, the, there's still certain kind of memories uh, that even though it's uh, not specific, even though the, the visuals is specific to Queen Street, they are also quite um, universal. So if uh, you, you go around, even like uh, say you stay in somewhere like Tangling Hot, Queenstown, uh, Red Hill or Topayo and you see the transformation of the landscape, there are certain things that you see in this artwork that I think will also be relevant to people who are slightly older. Uh, even for myself, I'm mid thirties, and recently I went to Changi and went to Salita. Uh, it's it's not the not places that have long uh, spent a lot of time, but the the changes that I noticed there, uh, I can feel the certain impact there because I know certain memories or the places that I want to go to are uh, can no longer be revisited. Yeah, so so I think even though the artwork is uh, specific to the site. There's um, little bits of uh, subject matter that you can find around the piece that is uh, relevant across uh, the various age group. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, Catholic churches around there. Uh, so easily along Queen Street, I think you can find at least um, three main ones, including the Cathedral of the Good Shepherd. 
And um, this, uh, if you are interested in knowing more about the history around the area, do go to uh, the same YouTube channel. So Dr. Lai has, um, Dr. Lai Chiken has did a very good um, and comprehensive uh, introduction and, uh, and even go in detail about how the history around uh, Queen Street as well. And he shared about how uh, it's related to the bookshop, the Ta Po, Xiao Po, and then uh, the art schools, the art scene, then with art galleries, and uh, how it's also related to uh, the Japanese business community in the past, the Chuo Dori, or the, um, the presence of um, uh, the various uh, different active groups that you can find around the street. Uh, yeah. I think one, one more thing as well, right, is the fact that uh, I suppose in our age, you know, we, we do have, uh, again, friends who are older, friends who are younger, and the different things that we talk about help to kind of factor in what we include. So in this kind of like the middle area that we're in right now, we have certain references that some people, the younger audiences might appreciate and some that the older audiences might appreciate. And I think uh, it's this combination of stories and also very much what uh, the space is, right? So if let's say I mentioned Aming, you know, not everyone might know about it. So the youngest kids will go like, okay, maybe they know about a famous orangutan, but let's say what about the older, one, older ones who have first seen Aming uh, personally. So I think, you know, that already helps to kind of uh, tell you which segment of the audience they come from and i think we, we do have a, a whole range of different things that we've enjoyed and we think that uh many people have enjoyed as their as their current version of the history of queen street uh, so thank you and, and i saw another one thank, thank you for the compliment uh how do we schedule this with our projects uh <laughs> <laughs> just try <along. laughs> yeah just try i think uh, last it year is was a, especially tough also yeah, la. yeah. Uh, I also think because um, if that's also I think this also I think applies for people who are taking projects and doing freelance job is that uh, sometimes like the reason why I also agree to this I wouldn't say the budget is is awesome for this project but the reason why I agree to it is because one I I think having a mural in a, in a in a civic district is a nice thing to have um it's also something that I look forward to uh, working together with Daryl and. Uh, it's uh, that the project is interesting to work on. So when when there's so many things that uh, if, if your project is meaningful, you will definitely try to make time for it. Kind of becomes like uh, how why people spend find time for hobbies even though they are juggling with many many things. And how do I stay sane? Is yeah, in the <laughs> past, in the past, like when budget travel is possible, you can always uh, okay, I get this uh, nice nice project. Uh, the payment is up. I can I can take the money and maybe go Bangkok for a weekend or go somewhere. But now you can't. So for me, it's cycling, uh. Yeah. And okay, so uh, I think one one more thing is that some, someone's asking about all the different links. So that's uh, we can we can kind of compile all of them together and send it send out as a follow up email so that you can just kind of click and uh, enjoy them at your own time. And also when it comes to the different animals and species, so there are 168 different species of uh, animals that I've included there. Maybe there are a few more that I, I miscounted or forgot to count, but it's somewhere in their vicinity. And also, uh, yeah, I think it's a great kind of follow up question asking whether they're native, endangered or extinct. So it's actually a combination of all of these. So, you know, as with the buildings, you, you might see them in its different forms. We also wanted to capture uh, Singapore, the portrait of Singapore's nature in its different levels. So you, you do find some extinct animals, you do find some kind of transient visitors, you also find some uh, that are kind of really endangered as well. And in particular, one area I want to draw a bit more focus on is that of uh, perhaps what we call invasive species. So, you know, that there are two kinds of miners in Singapore. So you find, find a blacker and a, and a browner miner. And, you know, it's always kind of, uh, one of them is native. The other one is, it's a bit more invasive. So, you know, there are certain conversations like that. And we talk about, uh, is the invasive species uh, meant to be kind of driven out because it's, it's labeled as being invasive or and the native one kept or do we kind of think of this as just a reflection of Singapore's uh, let's say minor landscape during this time and it's going to change over the years and are we so are we kind of reflecting capturing this or are we kind of like making a statement and uh, I think you know these are conversations I would love to have but at the same time uh, we also would love to hear your stories and how you feel about some of these things. Okay so as we kind of uh, pull in to 12 o'clock, I'm just going to start our, you know, what you're all here for as well, just kind of um, 
uh, learning how to create your own mural. So uh, also bear in mind that we do have, it's not a lot of time to be making something. So we want to take you through some of the steps about how we make our processes, the kind of ideas, the, the steps that we use to kind of uh, craft an illustration. I'm sure that, you know, given a, a few more hours after that, you can kind of fill it up, color it up and make it uh, look superb. So what's going to happen during this uh, is that I'll take you through a few of the different stages. The first thing I want all of you to do is to think about observation. So uh, as I shared in some of the, the, the emails earlier when you sign up for the workshop, is to think about maybe a favorite neighborhood. Maybe it could be, again, a place that you grew up in with where you know, it's filled with many different stories, the current place that you work, that you live, that you are familiar with, how it's kind of built up, how it's uh, kind of spread out right now. Or maybe there's always a favorite place that you wish you could live or a favorite place that you just love visiting and you, you want to kind of create an illustration about. So this is the, the first thing that I want you to think about. And also I want to share some of uh, some pieces of work that I created that kind of builds on this idea. So again, so this is the, the cluster on the left. Uh, that we talk about, you know, being able to go deeper. And this is the space. So if you notice the, the, the aquarium section uh, as we kind of move to the, the place where, you know, human and animals really interact. So whether it's in the form of taxidermy or kind of cabinets of curiosities and also kind of like uh, pets in captivity. Or, you know, in this case is where the, the place where construction vehicles enter and we talk about the nature really just charging to the scene. And over on the side where we talked about that uh, fish tank-like quality of the 8Q building. So when it comes to the idea of observation right now, I just want to share some works that I think uh, might help you kind of think in a different way or kind of get, just kind of get the creative juices flowing. So in this case, uh, those ones, you know, just walking around my neighborhood, I found these leaves, or at least these leaves are growing on the bushes that I wasn't, probably wasn't supposed to plant. But, you know, I thought that with their kind of unique patterns, you know, they could re represent something that, uh, you know, could, could I turn it into something else to place it on my hand and create a stegosaurus out of it? And as Singh Lee mentioned earlier, you know, I, I love dinosaurs and I, I, I was on this project where I challenged myself to create a dinosaur differently in many, in a hundred different ways over across a hundred different days. So, you know, you could be inspired by, let's say the way a branch uh, grow, is growing, you know, the, the angle of the tree or, you know, even certain patterns of things that you find. And on the right side, you know, once I came across some thing, macadamia nut shells, which I, you know, I've never really seen before. So when I, I saw them, I thought, you know, I could use them to, to create different pieces of artwork. So, you know, if for all of you right now, I want you to think about a few different ways of creating. It could be just kind of, it could be collage, you know, things that you find around your house right now. It could be, you know, different pieces, different photos that you've located that you want to extract and use, or you want to draw it from scratch, you know, that's also another possibility. So, uh, you know, on your pieces of paper, and right now you can just think about, uh, you know, get, get two sheets of paper, one for drawing and one for writing. And in the first one, I want you to think about maybe three landmarks of your, um, your neighborhood that you might want to include. You know, three different animals. It could be your friendly neighborhood cat. It could be someone's dog that they walk, you know, every day. It could be uh, this crow that always eats your food whenever you're eating at the coffee shop. And maybe some unique people, maybe your neighbors. It could be a member of your family. Or it could also be, you know, let's say the, your, your favorite uh, Takwe Tao seller. So, you know, on the first sheet of paper, just kind of write these down. So I want you to just get all these ideas down on paper. Don't think about how you're going to draw them this yet or what, how they're going to look, but just kind of write it down so that um, you can think about how they might link with each other. So I'll give you maybe just one or two minutes to just quickly kind of jot down some ideas. And I think later we, we might do a little demo at the same time. So I'll just kind of run you through the different steps and then talk you through it. And then as I... Uh, Okay, maybe, yeah, I, I don't want to work, so maybe both of us will be drawing the, the video and see, see how it kind of plays out after this. Okay, so I think right now, you know, most of you have kind of identified certain elements. So, you know, the, the way we always kind of work in terms of uh, research, right, is that uh, in terms of process. So, Singh, do you want to share how you start? Let's say, if I challenge you to do this, how would you, how, where would you begin? What's the first, what comes to mind? Uh, for site-specific, you want to give me a site? Uh, Why don't you choose so a for my, So for myself, do you want me to share screen? Yeah, okay. Do you want to sketch hey. it out very quickly now? So in the meantime, I'm just quite curious. Uh, can you just raise your hand and just use the raise hand function if any of you have uh, been to the mural already? 
So I think some of you have shared that you've, you've popped by along the way. So how many of you have seen the mural and in person? And, and yeah, you know, have anything to, to share about it? So, you know, if, if, you, if you have as well, you know, is there a particular favorite area that you enjoy? Is there something that you feel that uh, is wrong, especially? I think I've been waiting for someone to point out errors in case let's say I've drawn a bird wrongly, or maybe the history of the, you know, certain, certain architectural elements are inaccurate. So, so we, we love this to be a, a conversation, if possible, you know, um, as we kind of move along. And yeah, also of the aquarium. So I, I spent uh, much of my secondary school life uh, keeping many, many different kinds of fish. We are spending all my hours on the different uh, fish forums. And so it's, it's something that, that I've always really enjoyed. I'm glad to be able to kind of uh, include so many different yeah, uh, aquatic creatures inside. Sing me, what brush is this? Call uh, Belgian artist brush. A Belgian artist brush. Great, and then Justin also commented that uh, she tends not to think of there being anything wrong in art, but you know it's different perception. So you know at the same time, uh, that's, that's something that we kind of did. It's it's our interpretation of history, our interpretation of the scene, and how uh, how how we see this through our eyes, and especially as uh, I guess someone of our age rather than someone that has you know seen the the space in many different forms over the years. Uh, so, so you're asking about landmarks. Uh, it could be so for where I stay. I, I thinking of the places around me. So I thinking like Thompson, there's the Tokok Sing Song, the coffee shop. And uh, for people, if you are you're not comfortable with people, you can think of food or other things also. Yeah. So this one is the the Tokok Sing Song, uh, Upper Thompson Road, Tokok Sing Song. And uh, that's so where I, you get in your late night prata. Uh, I think it's drawing. Uh, all of you, you know, you can think about whether you want to sketch out some of the different spaces already. So if you think about the landmarks, you know, what kind of angle are you going to create it? How are you going to be? Uh, are, you, are we just going to lay it out? Maybe you want to do it in a map form. So it's just kind of like uh, including all the different, all the different uh, locations and then you're going to draw different roads uh, connecting all the different, uh, different parts. Or maybe in your case, you want to think about how things are layered. So Thompson, uh, Marichi Reservoir, a lot of monkeys. La. So, so animals can be there. Then, uh, then a lot of these park also. Minor. Okay, then you have a cat. <laughs> what about your pop pop chicken? Oh, yeah, actually there's quite a lot of chickens. Might as well just draw chicken. The jungle fowl. So I don't know how many of you know, but so seeing this artist's name is Pok Pok in a way. And there is always a chicken hiding somewhere. So one yes. thing that, you know, in, in terms of process, we always find quite handy is that uh, you can think of the words. So you can write down, let's say, monkey, uh, chicken, minor. But it always helps when you, you kind of draw it out. Because let's say when you start sketching out, in this case, you could see, okay, maybe it's, it's this... Uh, you know, the, the fact that there are two monkeys, so monkeys always move in a troop, right? The macaques uh, exist in, in family groups and how they interact is something that's quite unique. Maybe you want to do a version where the, the macaques are actually uh, being uh, uh, turned into King Kong and then they're kind of like just crawling all over the buildings. Or it could also be a case where, you know, they're just kind of uh, being visitors and, and you know, the, the human visitors, the human version of visitors. So something like what Zing is including right now in terms of uh, people is focusing on, on cyclists because you know he's a uh, he, uh, Thompson here a, a lot of cyclists cyclist. yeah and of which you, you make up most of the the population there but also the idea that you know think of areas that you enjoy a lot so what's something so in, again in Thompson you know, if I were to create my version of Thompson maybe it's just filled with uh, lots of leaves and lots of uh, food but you know I, I wouldn't pick up on certain details so when we think about uh, the, a mural it's almost a portrait of the space so how do you identify the things that uh, are important to you or how do you identify things that are you know important in general or that are really visible so it could be something that's very obvious where okay you see this uh, the kind of the 
structure in McRitchie Reservoir, you know immediately where, where it is and what it represents. But alternatively, you know, if you want to kind of share a version of the space where it's, it's secret elements that, you know, only people who live there will identify or something that's quite unique, you know, that's, uh, that's also another uh, very wonderful angle that we can kind of present. Uh, we, we can present a mural. Okay, so we've got cyclists, we've got cat high boys, and then yeah, Pishan uh, nearby. Then you got people for RI, etc. as well. I think sometimes you find these people around also. Actually, no. Recently, there's more hikers. Uh -huh. uh, more hikers. Then they'll go explore Bukit Brown. Cameras, backpacks. Uh, binoculars, walking, uh, hiking sticks. Uh, hiking poles. Yeah. So it's like yeah, so you can have like three three kinds of people, you know. Yeah, you have more la. Yeah. So so sometimes this is how I, I, I might I might think of my ideas. I'll jot it down on my sketchbook before I draw. Uh but you have to find a, a site for yourself to uh, preferably something that's meaningful to you. La. So now that we've got, yeah, okay. So, so now that we've got that, and I, I won't switch back to the slides, I've just kind of talked through it. So I think it's a bit easier this way. So the, the next stage, you know, once you've got all these different elements, it, it comes to kind of figure out what the story is. So again, how, when you look at all these images, what is something that you can link? How you can, how would you be able to link all of these together? So as I shared previously, maybe you want a case where uh, we actually have, uh, uh, imagine a world that's being overrun by the macaques and the other kind of, uh, the guests everywhere, they're taking over the space. They are the ones kind of like cooking the food for you. And we are the visitors, in fact, into the space. So it could be a story from the angle. Or maybe uh, if you're a little bit more um, morbid, you want to focus on the Bukit Brown aspect, the, the, the cemetery aspect. And we want to talk about maybe a case where you've lost certain, uh, lost certain elements that they only exist in pictures, they exist in stories, in memories, but we're missing out on the, you know, we're really missing out on seeing the, the cemetery the way it was before or you know it's not quite as accessible as it was before so it changes the angle and, and talks about how we um you know we're, we're capturing different stages of history of this space so that was singly shared right now we see a lot of hikers as opposed to maybe certain other groups of people and drawing it right now we can even kind of uh identify a certain time in which this is drawn because of the references and of course you know if we start drawing characters with masks on we know which part of life uh which which part of uh you know time which period of time you're really kind of basing everything on so when you think of the narrative it could be a very literal narrative where saying okay i'm going to draw the space in the let's say 1980s when i grew up or it could be you know i want to draw it in the modern day i want to imagine a case where let's say what the future of this magnetic structure might look like 20 years in the future so it could be something that that just captures a time period or maybe you want to imagine an alternate reality in which the macaques are running the you know, run, running city, running the city, running the whole of Singapore. Or it could also be a case where, you know, you instead of focusing on the landmarks, you want to focus on the people because that's what makes the, the space special for you. How it's unique, uh, how it's, um, you know, how, how it really represents the stories that you're familiar with when you think of the space. So Christine has asked a question, which is how do you know when you're done other than if there's an explicit deadline, right? Uh, because art is an iterative process. So I think, you know, as with like today, as we're working right now, we have a very hard deadline. We have to end everything by one o'clock. So we know that we can only spend a certain amount of time. So sometimes, you know, if, if it's a commercial work, uh, commercial project is quite easy because it, it tells you, okay, you need to finish by this time. That's it. And then you obviously do your best. You try and work as fast as possible. So you have as much time you can to kind of... Uh, reiterate to kind of like uh, work on many different versions. But I think um, it's, it's something that, well, it, it's, it's, it's always tough because it's a conversation, you know, I might be doing something that I'll throw the same, hey, you think it's done, you think it's kind of finished, and you might say maybe the colors are not quite there yet, or it needs a little bit, something more to tie it together. So uh, I, I think it's, it's really by feel, if you are thinking about uh, a, a piece of work that's for yourself, you don't have explicit uh, deadline that you can just, feel when it's ready you can ask people or you know at the same time nothing's really stopping you from putting it aside revisiting it later and kind of just adding on to it so whether maybe you're seeing things a bit differently in future maybe you are also changing the you know you're, you're, you might just be getting much better 
So Singly, any thoughts there? When when is the work finished? It's never finished. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, it's never finished. But the thing is that uh it's uh it, it, there's always many versions of it. So if you've been you've seen my work uh, in our time, the Pita Singapura, the Singapore map, uh I always feel that it's not finished. But that, that doesn't mean there's there's no uh there's I see it as something that it always develops in different stages. So like for in in our time in the Peta Singapura is that uh, after cycling so much, is then I go to different parts of Singapore. I feel that uh, oh, I could have done this, I could have done this. But um, but the most important thing is that you still have to produce uh, something. You have to put it down and draw it out. Then you, then that's one stage, lah. That doesn't mean that you have nothing to to show. Uh, I think even for your sketches or so, some. So even for my own uh, pen sketches. Uh, during my cycling, I always go to this place. Uh, where is that? Uh, Kaijuan eating eating house at Balestier Road. So I I sketched that place more than four five times already. But um, each time you do it is a it's a different take, it's a different perspective, it's a different moment of time. Uh, and it's always something in development. Uh, but uh, and I see that's why. Uh, whether a uh, work is done. It, it's, it's never done but it can it, there's many stages to it and uh, the most important thing is that if it interests you you will keep exploring la. Um, and hence that feeling that is never done will be there but if it's a, it's a work that uh, that probably lost its meaning and you're not interested in it then you'll feel that it's done because it becomes a kind of a fair butter job that you just want to faster end and, and just and just chuck it away <laughs> yeah so even for this mural if if you ask me to whether I will add more things, of course I add more things. I like, yeah, after listening to Doctor Lai, I I would want to add this in. After listening to some people's comments and sharing about their own personal stories about the place, I will also want to add more things in. And um, and also I think that also answers the questions for the dream project. A dream project I think would be something that gives us time to keep growing and explore these projects. Uh, and in the future as well. It could be this one project that we're interested in you can always explore in the future and have the funding and time to do it. Um, yeah, so that's what I think about uh, artwork, whether it's being done. Uh, but, and then for that's for the case of personal artwork. But if you're talking about commercial projects, then there's a deadline to meet. And the deadline, the de- meeting that deadline has consequences. Because uh, if you lose, you 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 see the project get delayed and uh, you're responsible for it, then um, it's not only your time that is being lost and the cost is not only bad by you, it's bad by the clients and the stakeholders. And um, so in that kind of case, then yes, there's, a, there's this balance you have to find uh, when is this project um, presentable and you feel that it's, uh, it's, 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 um, it has a, it passed the test for you to submit to your client. And uh, that becomes an ethical question for yourself. So right now, as we, as uh, I think all of you might have done some sketches already. So you might have created some sketches about the, the different things of so the three landmarks, the three people and three animals. So Singli, would you like to show roughly how you would, maybe we can do a, like a quick thumbnail of the, of a potential mural and how you can kind of play out. So we also have a, question about a systematic process for developing a composition that helps when you're in a creative rut. So I think uh, this one is also asked, the, the question is asking about something a bit deeper as well, when you're stuck, how do you kind of get out of that? And uh, we can share some of our thoughts, you know, let's say something that's a bit more, um, some, how do you kind of break out of it? But in terms of, let's say on the, li- the literal interpretation of the question, right? So let's say singly with all this right now, how would you take all these elements and turn it into a mural? Like, would it be thumbnails? Would it be that's kind why, of moving that's why I feel that having a, a site or, or even a framework, and I think this is where the devil's part about the story comes in. So for me, is uh, I have something in mind probably is that, that tells uh, me reflecting of the area around my neighborhood, and, and in my mind, I can see a visual map of it. Then, uh, so here are some of the things that I draw for the elements already, and uh, so for me, it's like maybe I was, you think of it of like, 
it's almost like a dollhouse. It's almost like a kind of like a collage thing going on. And you're putting stickers everywhere. Lah. And here, here you have some certain elements and uh, you can arrange it. Okay, so uh, Bukit Brown, Bukit Brown, like you can do it geographically. It's, uh, so Bukit Brown can be on the on south side, then Meriji, Meriji can be here further north, closer there, Thompson towards the then Thompson. So you can find hikers at Bukit Brown, cyclists along Thompson Road. Then uh, maybe this cat high boy is going to do his canoeing at Meriji. Then uh, Thompson, Thompson, because yeah, you can see a lot of the cyclists will be at Tok Tok Sing Song there in the morning before before this uh, phase two phase two kick in. Uh. Then uh, so that's how the animals you find. So uh, my nuts you can find them around. Uh, uh, so my nuts you can find them at Thompson because a lot of food to eat. Yeah, so <laughs> you can you can lay out like that also. Uh, there's no right or wrong answers. The thing is what what makes sense and have meaning to you. So all the monkeys will be, you know, they'll, they'll be at Mary Tree. You can find them at Mary Tree Reservoir. Uh, yeah. yeah. And something yeah. to add is that I guess when we're working digitally, it allows us to kind of move all this about. So uh, it I would say that you're not stopped from doing this if you actually do it uh, with pen and paper because you can literally cut it out, move it around, and then stick it out on top. So this is uh, it's just a different way of working. And one other thing is that if um, you know, you, you can either kind of just move all around and what Sing Lee said, right? Do kind of collage, test whether this works, move it around, realize that, okay, you want the, the, the chicken even bigger and it needs to take be the focus of your, your story, of your narrative, kind of give it a bit more space. Alternatively, uh, hmm. see, can I get you to draw a little, maybe some small thumbnails just to show them roughly how you can plan out uh, hmm? like so let's you, say like, if, if so you this didn't is have how all this I, yet, how would you thumbnail so this is how I plan out already but if, if I if once you put it like that uh, so you can see a certain structure that so this area be Meritree Reservoir so I use I use the site to, to do my layout then uh, this will be Bukit Brown. It's almost like drawing a, a chart, lo. Thompson Road. Then the entire thing here, basically it's your Thompson neighborhood. La. Yeah. And you have a skeleton already. La. Yeah, so that and then all these are the little elements, the cyclists, the miners, the buildings, all the, all the little elements to it. And um, that's how to get uh, started. Just now, was there a question about uh, being stuck in a creative rut? Yeah, so any like any kind of like systematic uh, process way, or ways when you're stuck. So maybe like let's say what are the, your go-to methods for getting out of a creative rut? Uh, for myself, I think uh, from my experience in, let's say, I like the program and uh, architecture school, what I find very useful is that to stop what you're doing and just go and do something totally different. Um, because um, it's kind of like the mind is really stuck in a certain frame. So by taking it out, it's almost like putting a, like, like pressing, a, like to switch it off and switch it on again, that kind of method like, to me that, that works so for myself like if i feel stuck i might go and take a break it, but usually people are very afraid to do that say i'm stuck means i have to work harder then you'll be still stuck in that that cycle um so when i go out i think um uh, once my mind is taken off work for a bit and i see things that um that might not seem relevant and start but uh, but it it makes you think differently. And then when you come back to it, you feel refreshed, you, you find a different solution to it. And for me, that's what works for me. La. I know also sometimes like uh, nowadays because um, websites like your Netflix, your YouTube, your Reddit, they're also accessible. You could also go there and so get your inspiration. But sometimes I feel like if I look at Andre Wee's work, I ever look at... <laughs> I look, I go look at um, 
yeah, like all the different artists were like Giddy Lee's and then Tom Hogan or uh, Vincent May. I get even more stressed because I feel that, oh, no, no, I'm so terrible. I'm, I'm really, really bad at this. And then you feel more depressed. They don't feel like working. So, so sometimes it, it affects if people differently. And um, so, yeah. So, so to me, I think going to social media to find for solutions and look for inspiration more often than not actually makes me distracted and um, depressed to work on things. Yeah. Then if you turn to food, you get stress eating. That doesn't help. Also. <laughs> yeah. So go outdoors. I think going outdoors helps a lot. Uh, but now, uh, but you go outdoors now and just make sure you take the necessary precautions. Uh. Yeah. I think uh, some, on, on my end, something that I find quite useful, apart from uh, trying to work even harder like what was shared already, right? So I normally try and work even harder, get super, super stressed, and then uh, try it, and then eventually decide, okay, I need a break. But usually what I find really helpful in my case, and as I'm sure all of you will know, is that I love talking. And usually talking to different people, kind of like, it could be bouncing the same ideas of getting a different perspective on the same let's say the, the same challenge, uh, how would they approach it differently? How would they kind of like revisit it from a different angle that might make it easier? Or alternatively, mm. it could just be about talking about anything else. So we, we do find that a lot of all these kind of incidental conversations help feed and kind of uh, inspire the a main piece of work. But I think mm. at, at its heart is that we need to take a break from that, that thing that you're so obsessed about and getting mm. different perspectives from conversation, from looking at other people's work, from uh, taking enjoying a meal or just uh, kind of uh, distancing yourself for a bit. And that's, that's always very helpful. But I understand it's, it's tough because if your deadline, you're inching closer to the deadline, it's hard to say, I'm going to stop and take a break. Okay, so also, at this stage, we should, uh, yeah. You go. I see, I think also this question might be relevant to what Daniel Chu is asking about, um, would I draw similar memories of other massively altered landscape? So one, one thing I feel that from all this cycling is that uh, sometimes people ask me whether when I cycle to a particular spot, did I plan for it? Uh, it's, uh, there's no, I don't have a definite answer. Because sometimes I, I say that, okay, I want to cycle to Tangling Hall and eat a Tangling pancake at 3 a.m. But, but because the weather, I feel it's not very confident or uh, I saw this road with an interesting name, then I might just go there and explore. And... And I find that sometimes that, that triggers, uh, I feel that I find uh, interesting things about Singapore that I wasn't aware of. And sometimes when I, when I get back home, I'll go and do research on it. So Daniel Chu asked whether I'll draw places like the uh, old Sentosa, Solita Air Base, uh, pre-World War II police stations. Most of the time, I like to draw places that I have uh, certain memories of. And... Uh, even though there are times I also did places where I, I'm not so familiar with it. Because with places where I have uh, more familiarity, I feel that I have, I'm, bet being, I'm able to better react and, and respond to the site and hence draw it. Um, but I always kept this option open. And some of the places you mentioned, I, I did cover it in... Uh, uh, in the process of uh, doing uh, Peta Singapura and uh, in our time, the piece. Um, in the process of researching the places I draw, I also discovered some of these places I mentioned, uh, like Lentor and uh, Tenga, the old Tenga. Old Tenga has some meaning to me because my dad used to stay in the kampongs there before they did all the settlement. And uh, the old Singapore Turf Club, I also remember it used to be when horse racing was still done there uh, before I moved to Kranji. So sometimes uh, I, I also would draw these places in in the process of my research. And, um, and some of the sources also, I, I, looking through National Archives, Pictures SG, or even the one historical map, uh, there are times where uh, while I was looking for A, I also found B that, that was interesting, or, or it could be like, I have vague memories of it, but in the process of research, it triggered me to, to look out in these places. La. But uh, the problem is that there's always not enough I feel that there's not enough time to draw a lot of these places. Uh, my Singapore Street series, I covered some of these old places, but um, because of work recently, I haven't been quite able to go back to working on more. 
and there are still a lot of places in my mind that I want to draw. Yeah. So as we kind of look at the mural again, uh, or at least your, your version of the mural at this stage, you know, maybe you, you've planned out some of the different elements. So I, I think some of you might be drawing digitally, whether it's on an iPad or a tablet or, you know, just on, on the computer itself. So like what Singli has done over here, right? We see, um, we see like different areas. So what he's doing right now is kind of just fleshing it out. So if you know that this zone is going to be McRitchie, you know that the other one's going to be Thompson Road. So how do you kind of fill up the space? And uh, it's, it's really almost like a puzzle, right? We kind of put different pieces together and then we fill up, find ways to connect them. So it could be a path, it could be maybe the overhead bridge, it, may, it could be, you know, a, a winding road that kind of slides in between. So uh, obviously I, I wouldn't, Okay, Singli is a, a master draftsman who will draw really, really quickly. And if you ask me to do this, I'll be taking a significantly longer uh, time. So, you know, don't feel pressured to add quite as much detail into your piece. So just focus on, you know, out of the nine things that you've drawn, maybe you just want to focus on one of each. Maybe it just wants to be purely about buildings. So think about uh, what you want to focus on in uh, a limited amount of time. So like the question just now, right? If you have a hard deadline, what do you do? Or let's say, you know, if I gave you many more hours, you can do draw everything that you plan for. But maybe in this case, you just want to, you just want to uh, just finish this illustration during the workshop. So pick a few elements, think about how they connect and start kind of like drawing it out. So if you notice that, you know, Singh is leaving a lot of space all around in between the different elements. And we've got one question here that someone's asking. So are there common items that you recommend as fillers to connect your different parts together? Um, he's asking me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so since you it, since you are adding, I think the... this one is probably an influence of my architecture school in the rendering. So one thing that I always feel that one filler that always works is greenery. So in architecture school, we always joke that when you have nothing much interesting in your spaces, you see a lot of rooftop gardens and greenery. <laughs> yeah, so if your spaces is boring and you see a lot of people spamming a lot of these green green things everywhere on your models on your renderings. Probably means that there's not much interesting things. Uh, but for myself, I think one thing interesting about greenery and perhaps it's also influence from Daryl and uh, his friends who are into nature is that uh, not all greenery is the same. So you can see a lot of different species of plants. If you want to research on it, you can definitely find many different kinds of plants to draw. And uh, so for me, sometimes that acts as a feeler. Or I would just put in people or it depends on the the subject matter sometimes I end people or food I can find around the area as a filler. Uh, so one like another I think it's I also see this question about which illustrator is a bit biggest influence on my style. So when when I was young I always read uh, the comics uh, Adventures of Tintin by Hajj uh Joseph Prosper Remy and um I also spot I watch and read a lot of this uh Shouting Down the Ramon by in Fujiko F. Fujikyo. So, uh, so, so the thing is that I think when the, the um, yeah, so comics have a huge influence on me and then um, during my uni days, I picked up this um, book by Guy Delis. So he did the uh, Jerusalem Chronicles from the Holy City, uh, Pyongyang, uh, then uh, Burma. And what he does and that he look at all these places and he don't just look at the media depiction of it like the, the standard kind of representations of all the different sites and try to look for things that are personal as well and i think that that was something that i tried to look for in my artwork and add my little things in it mm, other influence for aesthetics uh, like there are some artists like vincent may and then there's uh, Tetsuo, I think Tetsuo Yamaguchi. Yeah, there's many people you can find nowadays on, on Instagram as well. Uh, and, uh, but you feel a bit stressed uh, if you found all these different illustrators. Yeah. So those are some of the illustrators that have influenced on my style. Uh, but I think the, the Tinti influence is very distinct here. So one thing when it comes to influences, you know, we, we can look at other fellow illustrators, but... Uh, at, as Singli shared, it might not always be the best thing because you can compare yourself directly to them. So if let's say you are 
if, if you're an illustrator, it's, it's always quite handy to be looking outside your field as well. Although it's, it's very easy. I would say that, you know, immediately if people ask for our references, we go to illustrators just because we're so kind of deep in that space. But I would say it's very important, you know, could it be, in my case, it, it could be other, or at least one of my biggest influences would be like Sir David Attenborough. And I always feel that, you know, he's the one who got me interested in, in nature growing up. He's the one that kind of like opened my eyes to, to look at the stories, look at the, the way nature is being presented. And um, l- looking across these different areas, it always inspires you because you can see how, how they've tackled their field, how they approach things in their field and how um, you can relate it back to what you do. So it doesn't look like you're just kind of copying someone else, but rather uh, learning from them and picking up on, on different skills. But if you do ask us about our illustration influences, I think the list will be endless. Yeah, the list will be endless. Not only uh, films also. I think films also have quite influence. So some of the animated films so studio ghibli one is also one of those influence mm-hmm. then uh satoshi kun for his uh, books like paprika um then uh thing there are some of these uh directors also i think they are quite common when cited for influence including your quinton tarantino your wes anderson's mm-hmm. yeah so sometimes um there's the references and the influence is always great it's never static so maybe a uh, Maybe five years ago, if you see some of my works, I, I really try to, five, six years ago, I try to moderate after Tintin, the style of Tintin. I try to imagine Singapore is being rendered in a Tintin way. But along the way, I think uh, as I watch more films and uh, meet more people, there's also a uh, kind of a shift in my, my influence as well and who I take influence, uh, inspiration from. Um, it, it's always changing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so here I'm, I'm trying to draw like parts of my Then uh, even though even though it's a key elements there, already, I can it's not definite. You can always add in more things. Uh, because uh, this 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 is just a skeleton. You can always add in things that you want to put in. Uh, sometimes it's like what during the process of drawing. Like, oh yeah, a lot of people like to go maybe to for running. Then um, I might just add those in. Yeah. Then and I still kind of drawing, so think uh well actually I don't I, I was gonna say that they're monitor lizards that are yeah, they're monitor very often. lizards. And as all of you are creating your mural, so one, one more thing to think about is that instead of uh kind of uh after you've kind of added your main elements there, right? You you kind of think of the structure or what the meanings gonna feature, think about how they're gonna be interacting with each other. So let's say, you know, in this case, the our our student is going to be kind of encountering the, the monkeys in a bit. So what's going to happen, you know, are they, you can even start exploring interactions. So um, on the idea of a fillers, it can be literal kind of space fillers to build up the composition. Maybe you want something that uh, leads the eye across the page, but alternatively think about how the, the story helps to connect different elements that, that leads you through the page. So if, um, you know, right now we look at the, the boy kind of looking this way, we look at the monkeys looking this way, then maybe they're, they're both, for example, looking at a monitor dessert that is uh, right in the path. Or you can think about the, what, what kind of interactions would these characters normally have with each other. Okay, so while Singli is drawing, I'll move on to the next question by Annabelle, which is that, so that there are quite a few murals in Singapore that are just kind of there temporarily, right? So, you know, it's uh, plastered onto construction barricades and it's updated move or change. So she's asking what we think would be a good way to archive or review them after these have changed. And also referencing, you know, um, murals or graffiti in other cities where artists keep adding to it, you know, it's, it's never really a permanent fixture. It, it might be there for just a few months and then someone else comes uh, along and, and covers it up. So I, I think, uh, yeah, it, it feels like it, it would be, maybe, maybe you don't have that much of a, a culture of, of street art as well. So it hasn't really been done so much, but I'm sure that the murals that we see, uh, the lots of murals that we see all around Singapore, the ones that are painted especially have been more than captured through lots of people's like individual snapshots and yeah sing me what else do you think mm, it depends on the nature of the work like you can find uh Ernest Zakharovic's street art around Singapore but I think 
Um, the artist then was planned that well, he's, he's, if I'm not wrong, he's thinking of certain of his uh, murals that you can find around Singapore and most notably uh, Georgetown in uh, Penang is that they, they are also presented as something that is uh, intangible. So he, like you can see the, the murals actually fading, uh, fading, and that was part of uh, part of street, uh, street art, I think, for, for his take of it. Um, and then is replaced with another artwork or and touching up is actually not something that was uh, envisioned in his treatment of the murals. But um, at the same time, it's like when that happens, it means that uh, the canvas is always being renewed and there's more people as opportunity to present artwork in the, as a mural form around the city. La. And uh, over the years, you can see a lot of murals going on. I think quite recently, there's an artwork in Little India where they presented I think at least five uh, new murals by local artists, if I'm not wrong. Um, and you still can find a lot. Like, go to Tanjung Baba, you find a lot of artworks by Yipiu Chong, Little India, also you can find his works. Um, there's still more of it. But it's um, compared to, I think compared when, uh, when we started illustration like six, six, seven years ago, murals are like something that is not really thought of, not not a lot of people do, does it. It was not that common. You can find certain established uh, artists then, I speak cryptic, they have certain works you can find around. But uh, more often than not, they, are, they tend to be quite small projects compared to now. And they're also promoted in uh, Singapore Tourism Board as something as a kind of attraction for people to look at as well. I think having said that, it would be, it'd be really nice if, if there's uh, an official <laughs> kind of register. Maybe it's in someone's kind of like personal project to document all the different murals, or maybe it could be something that's, uh, yeah, I, I think it'd be a bit tough if, if it's anything more official than that. So may, perhaps some of you over here would love to kind of uh, document all the different ones as it changes across years. But at least for the ones in, uh, outside Sam, it's been officially kind of captured as well. We're hoping that so Google Street View right will now. document yeah. it as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they actually captured so the previous just a few more weeks for that. us. But uh, the Herman Chong's hour is captured in the Green Street view, but they haven't taken Queen Street recently. <laughs> mm. So maybe keep submitting like it has changed, it has changed. You have to swing by again. Okay, so uh, right now we're at twelve forty-five, and I understand. So Annabelle has shared her work on the Google Drive link. So maybe in, in a bit we can we'd love to hear from you and, and hear about you know what you've created and uh yeah just tell us a little bit about the scene. So uh for maybe we'll give everyone about five more minutes to see if there's anyone else who wants to upload your your sketches, upload your whatever you've drawn. So don't think about it as anything that's meant to be finished. It's a really short amount of time, and uh this session we really wanted to focus on. Uh, just getting ideas out, uh, kind of guiding you through the, the conceptualization, uh, observation and thinking process rather than saying you're going to be creating a full mural at the end of it. So, you know, if it's if it's a plan, you know, a label plan, that's great. If it's uh, just a very loose sketch of the skeleton of what you want to do, that's fine as well. Or whatever you have, we'd love to see some of the, some of some of what you created. So that once again, the link is in the the link is in the chat. So just click on it and can upload your stuff there. Okay, so Philip has another question. So from an illustrator's perspective, and uh, in my case, given my familiarity with local animals, what would my nomination for the national animal of Singapore be? Well, this 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 is a tough question, I would say. So uh and as of now, we, we do have a few kind of like official local animals. So, like there's, so the crimson sunbird is our official bird, which I think many people aren't even aware exists. And um, let me see. Yeah, some people well, felt this, that this uh, construction cranes should be our official bird, <laughs> <laughs> even it's so prevalent, prevalent everywhere. Singly, any, any thoughts while I, while I still continue thinking about this? This one is your area of expertise. Mm. Yeah. So your vote is construction crane. Probably yeah, it's very relatable to so buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly. Sadly. <laughs> construction cranes. <laughs> hmm. I'm I'm still thinking. Philip, I'll give you an answer before the end of the session. Why well, this is like asking you what my favorite food is? Hmm? Quit up. Oh, that, that, yeah, that right. one's your favorite food is quit up, right?
I would say like, hmm, in terms of my national animal, I think, uh, so since we've got the non-existent lion right now, we also have, uh, so it's, it's quite interesting just kind of thinking about it, right? So we've got the lion that doesn't exist. We've got our uh, fictitious lion at the same time. And I think it's it's always a bit tricky. So most of the time when I think of national animals or national animals when it comes to countries, it's always something that's quite charismatic, something that's big. And you rarely see, let's say, oh, our national animal is the... It's, it's something tiny. So I, I guess it's, it's a little bit tricky because... Um, you know, we are part of the Malay, Malay Peninsula and much of many of what we find in Singapore is also kind of uh, represented all throughout the region. So let me see. But if I had to choose, wow, this is tough. Mm -hmm. I okay, personally, I would love something like the reticulated python just because of, you know, uh, how it's it's something that's it's huge. It's potentially one of the largest snakes in the world. It is um, I, I love the patterns. I love kind of what it represents. It's uh, or at least snakes in general. You know they get a relatively bad rap, but they they have so many uh, wow, yeah. It's a bit hard to spin. It's a bit hard to spin snakes in a positive, in a positive uh. I think if you go by popularity, like, like, it'll be otters, right? Yeah, it'll be otters or hornbills, I would say, when it comes to that. Wow. So I, I think, uh, and, and they're also, in a sense, really charismatic. When you see them in family groups, the way they squeak, the way they kind of interact with each other. And I think, uh, yeah, if you go with popular stuff, it's probably an otter or hornbill. Although I, I am familiar that Malaysia has a, uh, the rhinoceros hornbill is one of its kind of mascots as well. So many things to think, okay, I, I have not given you a satisfactory answer. But in terms of what I would love, I would probably choose a, a, a snake or a fish. In terms of what I think would work nicely would probably be either the otter or the hornbill. Sorry for a not very good answer, but oh, I see Fabian being drawn inside. I wonder if he's inside. You know what Dr. Lai is sharing is his favorite is the tapir. And I, I, I personally, I love the tapir just because of how kind of uh, graphic it is. I'm always, um, I, I, I always love animals that, you know, are very distinctive. So whether it's the geometric shapes, whether it's the kind of contrast between black and white. And, uh, you know, you imagine a, a tapir to really stand out in the jungle just because of how it doesn't fit within the, the kind of landscape, right? When you think about, when you, you think about, uh, the thing about greenery, the greens and browns, but the way the kind of sunlight dapples, the way it, you, you see shadows working, I, I, I think that the tapir is one of my, it's one of the, my, my favorite kind of uh, animals also, and it's known to be a tank. So we kind of just run through it. So let's say in South America, you get the Brazilian tapirs that uh, the jaguars cannot kind of, you know, have a lot of trouble kind of hunting, or even the other, you know, big, big cats that used to exist in Singapore. So we had leopards, we have, um, we, yeah, tigers even. So tapirs are very formidable animals, as those are as they look. Okay, and so we have, uh, let, me, let me move on to the ne next questions also. So um, we have, WK is asking, so Singly, can you make your work at SGH into a postcard? Or is there one already? Huh, there one you have to ask SGH because they are the okay, clients. <laughs> I, 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 cannot, I cannot make the decision for that one. <laughs> yeah, it's for the SGH 150-year uh, uh, anniversary. But that piece, I think that's what she's referring to. And a next question by Mario is that, uh, can you share how you started your illustration career? Asking me or Daryl? Oh, you can you go first. Huh? You go first, it's good drawing. La. Okay. So while well, seeing me is how I work and I'm just here talking. Uh, in, in my case, um, I think it's, it's more of kind of being interested in some, it's a, one knowing I wanted to do something more kind of creative, but not being very sure. So I only kind of just uh, discovered illustration as a field, you know, even as a career um, after graduating from 
uh, JC and then deciding, okay, what, what am I going to do with my life after that? So as I always share, you know, it's, it's my time in NS that was quite formative. It gave me a lot of time to kind of explore, look at different options and try things out. So just before uh, boarding, um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar here with Threadless. Um, it's a, it's a t-shirt design company that one of the first few companies that started crowdsourcing. So you could just submit your designs and then if you like it, they'll print it out. So th that was a great platform for me because it allowed me to test my designs, you know, whatever work I could do uh, in a public setting by strangers who didn't feel they have the need to kind of be nice or kind of give like nice compliments. So this is... Uh, so this was a great platform for me and I always encourage to say uh, others who are interested find opportunities to test your work and, and right now you can just post it on Instagram the way you get feedback and the way you can kind of ask for kind of uh, feedback along the way helps you kind of hone your craft to decide what you enjoy uh, what you like the most and you know how people kind of respond so you know you might pivot a bit so I used to draw things a bit more realistic and now I'm most towards more uh, work that's geared towards, uh, towards a more family friendly audience and then from there, just kind of, uh, I slowly discovered I like creating picture books for children. I like working with museums and kind of in this education space. So if I were to summarize, it just started out, uh, I wanted to do something creative. I wanted to draw something and uh, to just kind of create uh, stuff for a living. And then I slowly figured out what my niche was and which area I enjoyed. Uh, so Radia is asking a question about connecting. Well, so we're going to be sharing our, we're going to be sharing our, contact details after that. So you can just kind of note it down and we also send it out in the email after that. So in case you miss any of the things, once again, we'll be sharing the, the video, uh, the chats that we had in relation to our project. We're sending the mural links, uh, the registration link for the last uh, session, last program that we've got planned and also some other details along the way. Mm, so, okay, I shall answer okay, so, the, do I, do I answer about the, how I get started? Yes, yes. Uh, then I'll, I'll prepare the next two. So we've got two more, okay. uh, two more mirrors of uploaded. So while you're answering, let me just check through that. Okay, so uh, how I started was by accident. Uh, for Because yeah, I grew up, you know, it's like usually our, our aunties, uncles, and my mom would think that, oh, yeah, if you would be an artist, you'll die poor at the time. You only have money after you, you die. So it's a very Asian thinking and I didn't plan for it. So I took to architecture and I was prepared to just go work in a firm <clears throat> and just and just yeah, just do it and uh, it would be just a hobby thing. Lah. But um it it was during um uni when one of my early works, the the quay, the quay pieces that I did of uh, the different quay you can find around the markets. It was it started off as commission work for Peranakan restaurant in Singapore. But in the process of researching it is that it's not so definite that it's not it's not like you can recognize a certain way as definitely Peranakan. Is there's this whole mix of culture, uh overlapping uh technique cuisines in in the 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 whole series of ways that I can find. And that got me interested in uh, exploring this area and uh cultures in Singapore. And also after after I did that work, it got um it got viral when it was shared by uh, Mr. Brown and uh, certain certain other figures and and I think that was the first time that I actually made uh, I feel that I can make a decent income that through through my vendors and prints and that income helped me to pay off the materials that I need in architecture school and hence. Uh, it was uh, something that is accidental. Uh, going into illustration and and that's how it started from there, la. And slowly, I did drawings for other and other people, uh, commission works. But um, you, I won't say it's easy also because I was sharing with Daryl that in the past when I started, <laughs> when I I, I charged for artwork. It was really at the bargains. I A4 piece I actually sell for $15 or $50, even though it's very urgent. And um, of course, that is not sustainable because if you do 100, 100 pieces, probably that might not be enough to pay off your tuition fee loan or this as well. Yeah. And you have to learn the hard way in the, in the whole process. Uh, I think Daryl himself also at times will come and ask me, oh, how much I do the quotations? etc. 
so it took it took quite a while it took quite a while at least two three years to figure out and but but the journey was uh kind of like accidental and but there's also this decision that okay i want this rather than uh do uh the a nine to a desk job at an architecture firm mm, yeah but uh, there's always that uncertainty whether there's a project coming in the next day or or whether there's, whether there's enough income la. so there, there are those challenges there and you have to juggle everything so it's just not it's not just just drawing anymore you have to take care of the legal side you have to take care of the finance side you have to take care of your own time management and uh, not fall sick as well because <laughs> your product capacity dropped to zero once you're sick uh, and during this kind of COVID period it's even more scary so I think waiting for the result, the swap test was so worrying for me <laughs> because it, once 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 you you're hospitalized, means your production stops and your deadlines will snowball. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, we've got a few murals <laughs> that we want to share. So, uh, yeah. Shall we go on this? Simi, would you like to just kind of zoom out and show everyone you created first? Then, I mean, after that, we can, uh, yeah, go through some of what uh, the you know what, what's been uploaded. Um, okay. I just write. So yeah, I put I put some of the things together already. Uh, I haven't I haven't done the Thompson side. So so you can see I did the Bukit Brown. I did I threw the Bukit Brown in and threw the Marriage Reservoir in with the Kehai Boy. But along the way, it's like oh yeah, it's near Adam Road. So I included Adam Food Center with the the Nasi Lemak. You can find that. So that's that's something that how how sometimes I I, I structure and I build up on my artwork. But you start off with a few key elements in mind and eventually you build it up. So that's that's my approach of doing things. So eventually you put on everything together and in the colors. Uh you get a collage artwork that tells a, a bit of the, the story uh of the Thompson area. For me, it's Thompson area and what what it has and the the focus on which the uh, which element you decide to feature, that becomes something that is personal to you. Um and uh, and there you have it. Like you have you have a you have a collage that is uh, personal and it's also uh, relating to the places you live in. Great, thank you so much.